When I tell you this was the best season ever made, you just have to believe me. I am not your precious vanguard. Mystery. Community. The chase. The sheer power fantasy. And the split. Welcome to Black Armory. Mystery is the theme with Black Armory, but nostalgia is partially what brought you to this video and partially what brought you to this channel. So this month in honor of Halloween, it's time to visit gaming's most mysterious and nostalgic games. Every single day in October, I will be playing some certified classics like Sly Cooper, my favorite series as a kid, Majora's Mask, a game I've never played before, Dead Rising 2 with another mystery creator, and way more. If you like running raids in Destiny, then moving over to some classics, join me on Twitch this month, where I'll also be giving away Lightfall merch and gamer subs. Link down below. Mystery hunt number two, speaking of gamer subs, is now live. I've hidden 10 codes in this video for gift cards, and y'all were fast, so we've had to step it up this time. If you get one in time, just use the code when buying something from Gamersubs, and use code EVAN at checkout for all the titty cups, healthy flavors of banging drinks, and more. Good luck. When you think back to all the best moments in a video game, what sits on your mind? That one memory that stands above the rest of them. The reason you play a game. The reason you continue to stick with a game through thick and thin. The moments that feel like they can never be reached again. Is it in your head? Is it a fact? Or is it a misrepresentation of the past? Today, we discuss the very first season in Destiny history, and one that made me confirm my own idea of what a season should be. The standard was set so unbelievably high with Forsaken that the Black Armory was faced with the toughest challenge for Bungie and Activision. A challenge so tough that Activision considered Destiny a failed franchise. So the stakes were set. A player base was about to be rocked by the very first ever drip fed model, meaning that content wouldn't drop all at once, but weekly to combat a drought in the game like the Taken King and Rise of Iron Faced. To be clear, this video aims to review and cover everything that made the Black Armory the first season, for better or worse. So welcome to my ultimate deep dive into my favorite season. You could argue that the lack of content in the current climate of Destiny 2 would make you frustrated, but lack of content versus lack of any substance are two different discussions. In vanilla Destiny 2, the game had plenty of content, but the game didn't even have movement fast enough to achieve the basics. Crucible games dragged on so long that they were ending due to time limits and not to score. And seeing a super pop was a rare sight since it took so long to obtain. Major changes had to be made at Bungie HQ. And with their backs against the wall, Bungie delivered a DLC for the ages in Forsaken. We have already gone in depth about how great Forsaken was in the Forsaken 4 years later video, which is over an hour long and you should check it out if you're interested. A quick summary of why it was so successful isn't just because it undid everything Year 1 did, but because it doubled down on everything that made Destiny 1 special. Rare Exotics, a fully fleshed out campaign, two new locations, a full new leveling system, incentive in every single activity, a raid that is considered one of the best, if not the best of all time, and brand new activities in the Shattered Throne Dungeon and Gambit. It wasn't that Forsaken had a big drop at first, it's that Forsaken gave Destiny players a full buffet of content in every portion of the game. Every single player enjoyed Forsaken for their own reasons, and the cycle of content kept coming. Need an example? After the raid was cleared, the curse week began, adding new secrets, new bosses, and of course, the dungeon, Shattered Throne. 
This was also the first time players got to meet Marasov in game, and not via a cutscene, confirming she was alive. There was pyramid teasers, there was a level climb for the ages, and the game was just in a state of controlled chaos for balance, letting players just have fun all year. Bungie introduced the idea of seasonal content in Forsaken as well, so for $10 a season, there would be bonus content on top of the Forsaken content players already bought. The idea of weekly drip-fed content was something brand new for the game, and Bungie would have to make a great impression here to get players enticed with the new idea. Forsaken's Dreaming City was a testing ground for this, showing how week to week the progress of the city changed, but with the Season of the Forge, aka Black Armory, it would become the real proving ground. So, how did it go? Black Armory released on December 4th of 2018, but before it even launched, there were already signs of life. Yes, you can actually get some weapons job right now. Use with a bit of luck. Around the planets for about a week before Black Armory dropped, and without an announcement, Forge saboteurs with shields near a chest spawned in. If you killed these, they had a chance to drop the Black Armory weaponry before the release of the season, making players' minds race on what the weapons would be like. Weapons like Huskow, Atalanta D, Dead Man Walking, and more came as random drops with random rolls from these roaming bosses. What was good about this was it really pushed the idea that Black Armory was a part of the world, and it meshed well with the ongoing story. Players also got to work mapping out where the forges could be, and Out of Bounds glitched into some of them early. This was just the appetizer before the main course, but as surprising as this may sound with how much I've hyped this season up, unfortunately, the payoff of the armory was the opposite for most players on day one. But you need to be super high power level to complete the forge in the first place, and now you see the problem. You know, it's the first time Bungie's ever done something like that. It is jarring. Considering the responses by Bungie on the launch of Black Armory, I'm kind of glad that I waited. If you were strapped in leveling for all of Forsaken, then the Black Armory really was that extra spice on top of your grind. But if you played here and there, if you came back to the game after Forsaken's launch, you know, somewhere in there, this was a hellish day for you. Level requirements aside, players were also not too fond of the weekly content drop instead of the buffet that was Forsaken. Feels empty because we've been trained to expect something completely different from Bungie's DLC, but it feels paint by numbers and obligatory. Day 1 started with Spider telling you about the associates of the Black Armory and giving you a badge to enter the secret portion of the tower. This allowed you to go to this brick wall and Harry Potter your ass into said wall. There, a cutscene played out introducing the mysterious Ada-1, an exo we will discuss a bit later into the video. She gave you a quest to get into the forge, which involved a lot of killing of Fallen and a lot of back and forth. One critique that will always remain negative for Black Armory was having to go back and forth to Ada-1 every time you wanted to get a weapon ready to forge. I get that it's a part of the lore, but Bungie could have also made this way less annoying. Another criticism that a lot of people will push onto Black Armory is that these quests to unlock a forge felt needlessly grindy and you had to do it on all three characters. But I'd say the rewards were worth all the time investment. Finally, after all this questing, players could enter the Volunder Forge, the very first forge of the promised three forges for the season, according to the season pass. Keep in mind, you can still visit the forges in the current game, but some secrets have been scattered, some not obtainable anymore, and there's even some jank to get into Bergugia, and I've even seen you can get into Niobe Labs? More on Niobe later. Back in Black Armory and on Day 1, Bungie lifted the requirements of the first forge to the ceiling of levels. The recommended power level was 610, round 2 was 620, and with a boss on round 3 that was 630 power to beat. Keep in mind, this is in the days of Forsaken. Most players were around 550 to 600 power. Maybe some players above 600, but barely. There weren't the same tools we have now with our resilience. With our, well, everything that, let's be honest, has made the game a lot easier. This was the era of Whisper of the Worm. 
Ikolo Shotgun, and Midnight Coup, or Go Figure, being the best players had. And while they weren't bad, they weren't exactly the strongest fit for damaging this boss. The enemy density, the challenge, the reward, it was all there, but players weren't really having it. First of all, people complained that the activity was just pick up balls and throw it at the forge, but I thought it was fine for being a seasonal activity, and there's a lot more layers to it that we'll discuss later. Bungie did get flamed for challenging the player base in the seasonal content, but it was also by far the best loot we had ever seen in Destiny up until that point. So by the very next day, Bungie caved to the criticism and changed the level requirements to be more accommodating. Look, I know not a lot of you have a ton of time to play the game, and whenever I address feedback, I try to keep that in mind. But I think Bungie was too quick to cave to the pressure, and unfortunately later this season, the same conversation would be had. But we'll get to that in due time. The changes were made, and by day two, players were sinking their teeth into the seasonal content of Forges. The biggest compliment I can give these Forges is that they were perfect for this extra spice of enjoyment. They weren't overstaying their welcome, there was plenty to chase for great loot, you were able to choose the weapon that you wanted, and even having extra goodies to chase. Another part that a lot of people don't give credit to is that the rest of the game was very healthy at the time. Not only did you have these forges that were pretty dang fun, but the core of the game also had brand new strikes, PvP maps, there was a lot of sandbox balancing that just made the game fun. I think the core of the game speaks louder than a lot of people give credit, and why people like Seasons. In Volunder, the infamous Hammerhead came out, which was important for two reasons. First off, it was the first machine gun since Thunderlord the month prior to make its way into Destiny 2, and it was insanely powerful, with Rampage and Feeding Frenzy being the god roll. The other weapons weren't as good, but are worth mentioning. You have Striker's Sure Hand, which was a sword that was all looks and not really show, and the Ringing Nail, which wasn't a bad auto rifle, but auto rifles weren't strong at the time. You could also, on rare occasion, get lore to drop from completions of the forge. And on even rarer occasion, you could get a shader to drop from this forge called the Rasmussen Clan. These shaders would drop on random chance, but also a guaranteed one with curated rolls. Now, those curated rolls weren't a fresh-baked King's Hawaiian on the table, but goddamn, they were just as good to bite into. Curated rolls were a system now dearly missed, but introduced in Forsaken. These weapons would drop alongside other loot and would be Bungie's crafted roll of the guns, with what they believed to be the desirable perks, and these weapons came masterworked. For some weapons, this meant seven enhancement cores, and for other weapons... It meant the Feeding Frenzy Rampage Hammerhead with the Rasmussen Clan shader already on the gun. To add on to this, the mystique of this forge was step one in the mysterious box quest for Ada 1 by shooting the drones around the forge on round one and two. Now, if that wasn't enough for you, oh, there was even more to be found in the forge. You may have noticed some weird quirks around, like the interactable objects, a weird symbol hidden on a board, some sort of maze, and more especially by aiming down sights with Hammerhead. We will discuss this later into the video, and I promise you this is worth watching as this was the portion of Black Armory that puts it into the big boys category of Destiny. Here's a timestamp in case you want to jump right to it. Forges could have been lifeless and uninspired, but they were instead something worth your time. Aside from the day one struggles most players faced, this was a matchmade activity that many people appreciated after. Sure, you'd have that one teammate that was AFK half the time, and another that would forget where to throw the ball, but it was mostly great. Later that week, two major parts of the armory were released, the Forge Gofanon and the Raid Scourge of the Past. Since we're on the topic of Forges, let's jump to Nessus for this one. Gofanon Forge was more of the same, but with a quest to unlock it this time even more involved than Belunders. This quest involved tracking and killing some fallen under the Order of Civics and reigniting the Hidden Forge. Ada had this to say. Nice job, Guardian. You found another forge, took down the fallen, and saved the day. Is that what you hope to hear? Sorry to disappoint, but I am not your precious vanguard. That was 
rude of me. Now, the forge had fallen instead of Cabal to fight, more drones to shoot for the Izanagi's burden quest, and more weird quirks to it, like this writing in Nordic hieroglyphics. The weapons from this forge were pretty legendary too, being the Tatar's Gaze sniper rifle which PvP players loved, and of course, the amazing Kindled Orchid, the first hand cannon to ever roll with Kill Clip and Rampage at the same time. This forge dropped the lore, the Shader House of Mayrin and the bane of every Trials player's existence. It could only be acquired from a gold weapon frame, which meant twice per character per week. This exotic was a French beautiful monarch, the Poisonous Bow, that had me going crazy in 2018, in the early days of my stream, before I even made these types of videos. Oh! Oh, fuck! What? PvP was such a fucking chaotic place for Forsaken that not even Monarch was a problem compared to some of the other weapons. Plus, with plenty to chase in Crucible with Forsaken, I think players were more fixated on that infamous mountaintop we'll discuss later. So, speaking of later down the road, and on the road map, on December 18th, the Izanami's Forge was released, with the Dawning event. Izanami's Forge wasn't just a place to gather ingredients to bake for the chance at the first solar machine gun, Avalanche but it was instead the place to go for a pretty unique forge. After finishing another quest involving Vex, public events, and this really cool mission on Nessus with moving platforms, the Izanami Forge was now open. The boss was pretty unique too. Instead of it being a normal Hydra, this one had the shield points to shoot and rotate its shield for free damage. The rewards were pretty special too, with the bow spiteful fang that was really never all that good. And on the opposite side, the best pulse rifle in the game, Blast Furnace, which had Rampage and Feeding Frenzy it could drop with. Again, the same rules applied. This time the shader was the Satow Tribe, and the weird secret messages were still imprinted here too. With that, all of the Forge weapons had been discovered, with the Forges to grind for each roll you wanted, and the Season Pass no longer having Forges listed. In the meantime, and on the very first Friday of the Season, the raid came out. Scourge of the Past, a raid that I missed dearly in Destiny, released the same Friday of the season. And you may think that's amazing, but unfortunately players weren't too happy with the seasonal model even after this raid came out. Scourge of the Past was a great location that had never been done for a raid. Instead of a desolate dreaming city, it was an abandoned metropolis, overrun by the fallen, and instead of a raid focused on length, it was a raid focused on speed. Fallen, Black Armory Secrets, Crash Bandicoot Racing, a mech arena, no this isn't an ad, final boss, and some of the best weapons we've ever seen. This raid paralleled the seasonal storyline and did some things we haven't seen in a raid since. But real quick, the main sellers here were the loot. Anarchy, which we have a full video about, Threat Level, the best trench barrel shotgun in the game, Tempered Dynamo, the first fusion rifle to roll with backup plans since Plan C in Destiny 1, the No Feeling Scout rifle, which could get box breathing, and the rocket, which, yeah, it's a rocket and Forsaken, it's not going to be good. The real loot here was the Sparrow Always on Time, still somehow the best Sparrow in the game, being faster and better than any other Sparrow. Seriously, when is there going to be Sparrow Transmog? I can't keep using this one Sparrow. The real loot came in this, uh, um, should we censor this helmet? Scourge of the Past was fantastic. It was chaotic, it is dearly missed, and sunsetting raids has always sucked ass. I have a full video going over this raid that you should also check out if you're curious about day one and the entirety of the raid. So you may think that was it for the armory, right? Look, you see how much more time there is on the video. Let's get on the train and chugga chugga the hype into Project Niobe. December's still happening. The subreddit Raid Secrets lands on a discovery. By aiming down the sights of the Black Armory weapons, you can see symbols around the forges. This combined with even weirder elements in the Volunder Forge led an all-out chase. So while the chase for loot and the title Blacksmith were beginning, the ultimate hunt was underway. For the first time in Destiny's five-year run to this point, the lore was a major force in solving a community mystery for rewards. Normally, there would be a chase, perhaps for a javelin, 
perhaps for something much smaller like a certified large pat on the back. But now the lore community was at a call to arms to break down these Nordic, French, and Japanese symbols, all the while having to learn the lore in question and get lucky enough to get these pages to drop at the same time. Thankfully, websites like Ishtar Collective exist, and we're churning a minecart of information like a smooth trilingual butter. Lore collectors and puzzle solvers busted out their trusty strange coins to magnify the fine details of Ada One's story and break down exactly what the hell to do. You'd think we're playing an entirely different game at this point, and you'd be correct, as players would discover that by using the sights of Hammerhead around the forges, there were little symbols scattered around each one, and... <clears throat> While I originally wrote this section to be incredibly long and full of sharp details that led to Niobe Labs, I feel it necessary just to remaster a story on Niobe Labs for another day. It was an early video in my channel, and I feel like I didn't do that story as much justice as I could have. And after finding three emblems by shooting various symbols in the correct order with the Hammerhead, Tatara's Gaze, and Spiteful Fang, players figured out the final riddle in Nordic. By interacting with these three beacons, and only by having the three puzzle emblems, could you interact. Once you did though, a monitor in the Volunder Forge lit up with the final Nordic text. Oh, whoops, wrong one. Here you go. With eyes fixed, past dawn's end, the fourth flame will rise. Bring the knowledge obtained. By the Raiders of Secrets, steal thyself. And you think my ads are bad. All of the emblems would lead to none other than more waiting. December 18th was the final puzzle discovery, but this riddle was saying that another forge was out there and even more was calling out raid secrets to use their massive noggins and meat in Niobe Labs. By the way, in case you wanted to get these emblems now, you can see a lot of the symbols, but some of them are moved around. And I'm almost certain that some of these are symbols I've never seen before. I thought Bungie even sunset the letter R. But they actually just moved it over here for some reason. Oh, there's also some cool features here now that the forge is gone. Like a piece of paper with blueprints of something. The monitor is gone, but the message remains on a wall. And you can even walk on water for some reason. Now, the only thing left to do was to wait for Niobe Labs. Hey everyone, it's me, man that can move time. It's now January 8th and Niobe Labs is here. Without a location listed, without an activity marker, just pure community hunting, Niobe Labs was found in the EDZ. Bungie put a lot of effort into the secrets in Forsaken, and during the seasonal vidoc, they went on to explain that taking risks and surprising people is what they like to do, and that these are what makes the game special. And I fully agree, and want to see more secrets back, man, please! With Niobe Labs, Bungie couldn't have hit the nail on the head any harder. I think that's... With weapons and views, the ones we've made. Niobe's Torment, or Project Niobe, was a seven-level puzzle with so many challenges to it. This is the activity I would go out of my way to call the most unique event in Destiny history. Unlike Corridors of Time, anyone could attempt Niobe Labs. And while this could have been just more still puzzles, Bungie added layers to the challenge. This was hard to beat, and with no rally flags, no checkpoints, no knowledge of what to do first, Niobe was brutal. The ultimate goal was unlocking the final forge, the Bragugia Forge, to complete the Izanagi's Burden quest, unlocking the exotic Jotun, finishing the story of Ada 1 and Civics, and making all the forge weapons able to be made in this one forge instead of hopping around. Shooting symbols was under a timer, and there were bosses you'd have to fight under a tight timer too. Oh, and you'd be split up to take some of these down. And even more since we're going off the list, the power level increased each level of Niobe. Like I said, I'll be remastering this story one day, but this puzzle combined all of the elements of Destiny in one. There was gunplay, there were puzzles, lore, and a reward for the whole community, and that's what made Niobe Labs. You cannot go back and do this activity for yourself as Bungie has sunset it, and unfortunately, 
this chapter of the game, but we still have the memories of how it went down. Done. I'm going to Done. Oh! We fucking did it first try, bro! Bro! Oh! Let's fucking go, bro! Let's fucking go, bro! Now, that clip may be legendary. But Niobe unfortunately ended in tragedy, as Bungie opened the forge a day early, caving into the pressure by the community. I think on events like these, Bungie should have stood their ground, as this was an event that all of gaming was watching. But just like day one of the Volunder Forge, they cracked under the pressure. Nobody gave into pressure more than Activision, who didn't have enough faith in the seasonal model, so they took all of their money and split from Bungie. This has been seen as a victory in a moral sense, but a loss in budget sense. Now, it's safe to say Bungie is sitting pretty on a mountain of Sony money, but back then, it was newfound celebration and fear of losing all of the Destiny funding. It's safe to say now that maybe you don't want to be at Activision. No matter, the rewards for the players that completed Niobe involved a ghost and an emblem, available to all until Beyond Light. After the labs were open, and only after acquiring Izanagi's burden, there was another mission in the labs. By shooting more symbols in a sequence, the Taken appeared, and after killing the Taken and opening the mysterious box, the next step was to complete all the forges with full black armory loadouts, including weapons and armor. What was nice about the armor is that by using an item called the Forge Polymer, you could guarantee yourself a drop. Remember, this is before Umbrals even existed. After all this was done, an item dropped to give to Ada One and free her from her awful memories. Ada One's story is incredibly sad, and it ends with even more tragedy, since she's now the vendor for the awful transmog system. Isn't this like everything Ada One would hate? I don't, I don't even get this. I have left a link to another video going over her entire lore, so please give it a watch or watch my Izanagi's Burden video and its end to see more on her story. For now, it looks like it's closing time for Niobe Labs. You'll be missed, and one day, remastered. I hope Bungie can do something even better or just to this level. I would take a Niobe Labs 2 that's just the same exact idea, maybe in a different environment. Community needs something like that. Sunsetting was hell to all, and none felt the effects more than the weapons of Black Armory. The armor may have returned in Season of the Splicer, but the weapons are still gone. No weapon will be missed more than the Blast Furnace and Hammerhead, but Kindled Orchid never got its chance to shine as 150 hand cannons dominated Destiny 2 and Forsaken, leaving the 140 Kindled in the vault. Just like the Blast Furnace came the Blast of Mountaintop, the Crucible's third pinnacle weapon ever, and the pinnacle weapon that would go on to dominate the kinetic slot until it was sunset. On the opposite side of the spectrum came the pinnacle weapon nobody used, like Breakneck, which was an auto rifle with Onslaught, a perk that revved up the first fire rate per stack of Rampage. In the auto-loading meta, this perk was useful. Now, I don't think Breakneck would have a chance unless it came with a lot of ammo. The Vanguard Fusion Rifle also came out and... Okay, moving on. Black Armory dropped something that tends to fly under the radar too, the mods. You had Rampage spec, Dragonfly spec, Surrounded spec, and a lot more that came from this season. These mods paired with the custom glow you could apply to Black Armory weapons, the rare bounties for extra loot, the ship for forging 100 weapons, and more that just made this whole entire season shine brighter. That bright flash is what can also be described for the returning Last Word mission, with a finale of shooting the gun out of the hands of Hive. It was pretty dope. Overall, the weapons from this DLC are still the most powerful we've ever seen. Anarchy and Izanagi's Burden are still PvE demons, while Monarch, Jotun, and Last Word are all PvP demons. If the rest weren't Sunset, then I'm sure we'd be saying they're still the best out there. So pour one out for the best weapons of all time. Sometimes they say less is more, and I believe that to be the case with Black Armory. If you boil it down, this season had four forges that were just throw a ball and get a gun, a short raid, a cool puzzle, and an exotic quest. It was grindy to unlock the forges on all three characters, and it was frustrating getting everything at times, but I don't think we gave it the love it deserves at the time. 
Annual Pass content wasn't made to be sunset like these current seasons of Destiny are. They were made to be a part of the world. Anthology-like seasons to make the world of Destiny larger. What you see on the surface doesn't paint the picture of the armory. It's the community chasing puzzles, the extra loot, the secrets, and how carefully constructed such a simple season was made into so much more that made it truly stand above all. Before we head to the Drifter season, I have to say that I am one of those believers in less is more, and I am here to say Black Armory was the greatest season in Destiny history. Thanks for watching.